Scientists are working on a digital representation of the human heart, which can accelerate treatment options for patients and be used to help potentially diagnose future diseases. We'll talk more about this project on Today in Tech. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Today in Tech. I'm Keith Shaw. NTT Research's Medical and Health Informatics Lab is exploring how biological digital twin technology can be useful in predicting and diagnosing disease and illness in virtual scenarios before applying them to real-world settings. The company has developed a cardiovascular digital twin showcasing the technology, which can be a first step towards a fully realized digital twin. Joining me today to discuss the project is Iris Shelley. She is a research scientist with NTT Research. Welcome to the show, Iris. Hi, thanks for having me. Yeah, you recently gave a presentation uh, about this technology, so let's j- jump right in. And so, uh, describe what what you know how you guys define a biological digital twin and how it's similar to other digital twin technologies we may have seen in like manufacturing things like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so the bio digital twin is fundamentally the same concept that we see in other industries like manufacturing, just adapted to biology. So basically a digital twin is a virtual representation of some physical object. And this representation can be updated and refined based on data from the real world object. Um, So in our case though, instead of looking at a manufacturing line as our real world physical object, we're looking at your cardiovascular system. So your heart and your vasculature and the other body systems that they interact with. Kind of broadly, the aim of digital twin technology is to somehow improve efficiency and use the virtual representation to learn about and make better decisions about the physical object. So how did the so yeah how did how did the project start uh, in terms of like w- w- you know either your uh, par- participation in this or what was the re- is it just because they saw other digital twin sort of technologies as oh we can apply this to biological systems. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so actually one of the inspirations for it came from seeing the use of digital twins in the commercial aviation industry, um, where they're used for predictive maintenance. Um, So if you think about a plane, you want the engine to be well maintained before you ever take off. You don't want the check engine light to come on when you're halfway across the Pacific Ocean. You want that to have been taken care of in advance. And but, um, there are parallels to health. Like you don't want to wait to get sick. You'd much rather know before you have a problem, before something becomes acute um, and take care of it. So it's kind of a logical next step that seeing digital twins grow in other industries. Like there's really a big benefit for that potentially in the healthcare sector as well. Right. Okay. And then the the uh, the company cre- created a, a, vi- a video, sort of a concept video of what this technology could eventually evolve into because and it's, it's a very cool video when you know the first time i saw it i was like oh yeah, this is like really sci-fi stuff um it's got a person and and it almost looks like a fantastic voyage where you've got a bunch of nanobots that are uh kind of mm-hmm. invading the, the the system but yeah so obviously the video is like the you know this healthy person he's getting an alert and he's basically told to, to call this call his doctor he gets on the call with the doctor and um, they start going over some of the the health information um is that like is this where what you guys envision this thing could be in the future or 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 does this technology sort of exist now so that's yeah. definitely kind of a future okay. looking thing right um, so yeah the nanobots do not currently exist okay. unfortunately but is, it, um, is, but is this something that the nanobots could eventually sort of sort of enter the system and, and kind of help with the yeah. diagnosis yeah so for for right now what we're working on is more of providing information to a physician, yep. keeping them in the loop. But, you know, as technology moves forward, we can get better measurements in real time. So if, you know, someday you can have little sensors everywhere throughout your body measuring everything. And if those little nanobots can come and tackle the problem for you, um, you know, having having a digital representation of you that they can use to make their decisions would, of course, be helpful. Um, but we're also targeting having this be useful before those sorts of <laughs> advances come right, along. Right. Right. Now, so why did you why did you guys pick the the heart as sort of the first example of this? Yeah, so there's um, a few reasons. So, first of all, cardiovascular disease is the leading cause of death worldwide. So, it's a way that we can kind of constrain our modeling problem and have it be a little less daunting than trying to represent the full human body, but we can still have a really big impact on health. Um, It's also a very 
well studied and actually a pretty observable and measurable system. Um, so compared to a lot of what's going on in the brain, like we have a better understanding of what's going on in the heart. Okay. Um, and that, and it also kind of the cardiovascular system connects to everything else in the body. So it provides us an easy way um, to kind of gradually layer on other body systems as they interact with the cardiovascular system so that we can eventually achieve that full body biodigital twin. Okay. What are some of the, the metrics that you measure to get that data so that you can start building this, this, this model? Yeah. So right now, um, we're kind of focusing on the types of more invasive measurements that might be collected if you're in the hospital for some sort of acute cardiac event. So we're using things like continuous blood pressure measurements mm -hmm. that um, are collected from a catheter that's actually internally in an artery. Um, we can use things like blood flow measurements that look at how much, um, how much blood is being pumped to the rest of your body. Um, and then probably a lot of people are familiar with electrocardiogram or ECG recordings. So we can use those also to get information about your heart rate, how fast your heart is pumping and kind of the delays or synchrony between the different chambers. Okay. And yeah, so one of the interesting parts of the, the presentation that, that you gave recently about this was uh, an interesting sort of like when you go to the doctor, uh, whether it's for a physical or if you are actually experiencing sort of either chest pains or something like that, they take a measurement of what's going on. So they take your blood flow, your blood pressure, all of this stuff. But that's just sort of that one slice of time. Um, and so with this model, you could start seeing things where you know, if I'm wearing like a smartwatch or, or continually being monitored through other sorts of, of sensor monitoring, uh, then the doctor would have a bigger picture or a more complete picture of, of my health and my heart versus just that one slice of time. It, it, did I get that right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. I'm glad you, you listened well to the <laughs> presentation. All right. Yeah, that's the idea is that this is a way to kind of like all of that data exists over time and in various places, but mm -hmm. right now it's not well consolidated. So if a physician wanted to use, you know, data from previous appointments and data from your Apple watch, they would have to, you know, go into your health app and look at that. They'd have to read through years of medical records. And that just isn't feasible when you're just visiting the office for an appointment. Um, so this would do that work um, in the digital space. It would give them something that's much easier to work with rather than expecting one busy doctor right. to you know, make sense of it all. Themselves. Right. I, I'm just happy when my doctor remembers my name <laughs> and, you right. know, and yeah. hopefully, yeah. The, hopefully, you know, she's also reviewed all of the different um, conditions. Well, I don't have a lot of conditions, but you know, m at least my health status, right? Yeah, exactly. So, so, this so hopefully we'll make it. Yeah. So uh, once they have that sort of information, um, the really cool part, you know, is not just that you have all of this data, but then what do they do with this data um, that can really benefit sort of patients in the future? Right. So something that we're targeting that's a little more manageable in the short term is to start looking at different comparisons of drugs and how they might impact not just kind of a generic person, but how they would impact you specifically. So if you go into the doctor and you have high blood pressure that they need to treat, there are a bunch of different options that they could choose. Um, and there may be different pros and cons broadly associated with each of them, but it's not always obvious how those relate to you and any other conditions you have, any other medications you're on. Um, so having the BioDigital Twin would give them a platform where they could try out those treatments much faster than real time. So they can give your digital twin, drug A, drug B, drug C, mm -hmm. see how each of they, them perform, which you know achieves the goal that they wanted to achieve. And then just give you that one drug rather than maybe iterating through. Right. So, um, so it, without this sort of the, you would go to a doctor and the doctor would sort of, I, I don't want to say make the best guess, but, but it would make a decision. All right, well, let's try this because this drug usually works in, you know, 80% of patients. Um, and then yeah. they give you the medication. You go away for what, like a couple of weeks, a, a month, maybe. Right. And, and, mm -hmm. and then maybe you come back because it's not working. And then they're like, all right, well, let's try plan B, C, D. And so with this digital technology, you can do all of this virtually and the model will tell you whether something is more likely or less likely to work. Does that sound right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah exactly. It can help you know if you're going to be in the 80% that it works for or maybe yeah. the 20% that it doesn't. Um, yeah, that, that's, so yeah, that's, I mean, just that alone just makes it sound like it's worth sort of implementing, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, and I think... It's a good example of like in medicine, 
there's the tenant first do no harm. Um, so having a digital twin is great for that because you fundamentally can't harm the simulation. You know, you can try any number of drugs and you haven't cost the patient any time or any, you know, impacts on their health. Right, um, so right. Especially, just, especially if there are some well, potential side effects for some of this medication, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, so could this be then if you took the next logical step, could could you could this be used to start um, down the road of I want to say like patient specific medication? Is that something that could happen with this or is that a different sort of idea where you are tailoring uh, medication just for for me based on sort of my DNA and my, you know, let's let's mm-hmm. say you have a digital twin of me sort of. Is, is that something that's yeah. possible or am I mixing up two different technologies? No. So I'll say right now we're not at all looking into like drug discovery, creating new drugs. Okay. Um, but I would say the more short term thing is that, you know, maybe maybe it's not a whole new custom drug for you, but maybe it's some um, custom mix of drugs that are available that you need, like 25 percent drug A, 75 percent drug B or something. Mm-hmm. Um, so that sort of balancing of already available options is something that we could absolutely do with this. Um, And then, you know, longer term, there is possibility for something like um, virtual clinical trials. So this may be something where we can partner up or with, um, you know, pharmaceutical companies may have, all right, expect we'll have a strong interest in this sort of thing, but we're not there yet and we're not personally in the business of creating new drugs okay i'm gonna try to try to dig a little bit deeper and i may fail miserably here so you're gonna, i'm gonna need you to back me up if i or correct me if i'm wrong so how did you get sort of all of this this data in order to make these predictions about what about how the the different therapies or the different approaches would work um you must have a pretty big database and then do you work in like predictive modeling do you use artificial intelligence <laughs> i think what it is that you call it mechanistic or something like that right yes yeah yeah so, exactly um so so yeah to explain what a mechanistic model is that means that basically everything in our model is um correlated to something in the physical body okay. so it's not just like a black box it's actually structured based on you know decades of research that have already been done to characterize the cardiovascular system um so we kind of boil down um, the complex physiological components into more basic um, kind of standard mechanical or electrical components. Mm -hmm. So we can look at the heart being a mechanical pump, but then there are variables like how hard is it pumping? How fast is it pumping? It's pumping blood into a series of pipes that are your vasculature, but how much resistance to flow do they offer? How elastic or how stretchy are they? Um, So we have kind of the fundamental structure in place based on all of this general research. Um, And that also includes having knowledge about how different drugs impact different aspects of the system. So, um, you know, when you take a drug, maybe it's making your heart beat faster or slower, or it's making your arteries more or less stretchy. Um, So there's all of these kind of points where the drugs interact with the system. And then the point that we use your data for. So all of this so far has kind of been based on just general scientific literature and general experiments. Um, Then there are all those parameters in the model that we need to personalize for you. So like these parameters exist in some range for the full population, but for you specifically, we should be able to zero in more on exactly how hard or how fast your heart is pumping. All right. Things like that. Cool. And, um, you you currently use this for uh, critical care, sort of like people that have already uh, have a certain condition, like they have high blood pressure or they have some some problems with their heart. But this can also be expanded to the healthy population at some point uh, and then maybe be used to sort of predict down the road if you sort of age out the digital twin. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, definitely. Um, so... Right now, you know, you go into the doctor multiple times, your data does accumulate over time, but it's not kind of all getting tied together like we were talking about earlier. But if we can start, you know, using this in a digital twin, you can see how you go in today for an appointment, you get today's digital twin. Next year you go in, add some new data, it kind of refines your twin and you can see what's changing in your cardiovascular system over time. And then you can kind of extrapolate that forward based on, how you've been changing personally and what we know about how the cardiovascular system 
changes with age in the general broader population. Um, so then we can start making predictions that, you know, with your current lifestyle, maybe you'll start having high blood pressure in a decade. But if you pick up, you know, a new exercise regimen, maybe you can stay healthier for longer. Um, and so that's the idea of kind of the predictive maintenance where we can see where things are going before they actually happen and hopefully help patients to, you know, start an early therapy or ideally just make some sort of lifestyle change that will keep them healthy. Yeah, I, I think that that would probably be a little bit more effective uh, for a lot of patients to sort of see that map out. Um, in some sort of visual visualization rather than just the, talk, the doctor going, hey, you need to eat better or you need to exercise more, you know, because a lot of that kind of goes in one ear and out the other for, for a lot of patients. Um, mm -hmm. I'm just, just talking for a friend. Uh, anyway, um, <laughs> do you see this as, as being able to expand uh, to other organs in the body or, you know, you, you do mention the cardiovascular system that also includes a lot of other parts of the body. Is that sort of the next step where you can then start getting data on other, on other organs or other parts? Of, so, and again, what I'm getting to is, is it like, how, you know, can this be applied to be create almost like a full digital twin of the, of the human body? Yeah, excuse me. So yeah. right now we're kind of layering on other body systems as they, interact with the cardiovascular system. So like your autonomous, autonomic nervous system um, helps control your heart rate. Um, it has, you know, basically impacts everything in your body. But we also, something you maybe wouldn't guess is we have kidneys in our model. Um, and this is because they control fluid volumes mm -hmm. within your body, which also impacts blood volumes. So we're kind of, we're layering on different components as they relate to the cardiovascular system. But this gives us an entry point into these other systems that we do want to start, you know, over time as the cardiovascular portion has matured, then we can start focusing more on these other components, not just as they tie into cardiovascular health, but more broadly, um, just how they exist in your body. So yeah, that is a, a longer term goal of ours. Okay. And then is this, is this system like just with the heart right now, is this system that, is this something that can be, I don't want to say commercialized, but moved to the general public and, you know, are you working with doctors in, in, in trying this out and, and, you know, maybe working with some patients, you, you know, or is that not the responsibility of what NTT research does? Is it, do you pass it along to another company? Like how, when, when will this get into the hands of doctors? Yeah. So it is um, kind of like you've alluded to in the medical space, we can't just go into a clinic and give this to someone, you know, things need to be tested really yeah. thoroughly, which is a wonderful thing. Um, so we aren't a medical device company. We aren't a pharmaceutical company. So we will probably be needing to partner with other people who are more experienced with these regulatory processes. But with that said, within the next few years, we would hope to be getting into some preclinical and clinical studies using our model as um, just something that would provide recommendations. So this would not be actually, you know, acting on your body at all in any way. It would just be kind of a data point for a physician. Um, and this would be in studies that are the stepping stone to actually getting approval. And then hopefully in more like the 10 year time frame is when we could actually start to roll out this sort of system for a little bit broader use, but still just in the sense of being a physician support system. So still just providing recommendations, doctors fully in the loop um, and still, you know, actually delivering the care, making the decisions just with this. As All right. So, so this them. is, this is not sort of 50 years away or, a, you know, a couple of decades away. You know, this is probably five to 10 years estimate. Yeah. It, it depends what part of it, you know, this is a kind of a longer term yeah. vision. So when you start talking about the full body digital twin, um, you know, that's more of the 2050 type time frame. but we're hoping to get kind of, a more targeted um, cardiovascular biodigital twin specifically for a few acute conditions. We're hoping that that can start to be used a little bit sooner. What's, what's your favorite sort of part of this project? Like why do you enjoy sort of working on this as, as either from, from your background or what, you know, what excites you the most about this? I guess um, for me, something I've really enjoyed is that, this project is trying to take kind of a big leap forward as opposed to a lot of more corporate product focused R&D where you're 
sort of stuck making incremental improvements, um, which are very necessary, but it's exciting to get kind of the freedom to look at this long-term vision Mm -hmm. and just work towards that and work towards, you know, something that could be revolutionary rather than just the, you know, slightly improved next generation of something. Right. And, and t- tell me a little bit about NTT research, because it's different from a, from a sort of a typical corporate R&D or an academic university type of scenario. Like what, what, what freedoms does that give you being a part of, of uh, Japan's NTT, for example? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so a comparison I've heard that I really like is that we're sort of like Bell Labs was to AT&T. So NTT, our parent company, is primarily a telecommunications company. But like AT&T did with Bell Labs, they have an interest in supporting kind of a broader R&D than just the work related to their core markets and services. Um, So we're working on more basic research that isn't going to be commercialized right away, but has that like exciting long term potential. And this gives us a very practical benefit is that we have more built in funding and stability than in academia, where you're kind of constantly applying for grants and fighting for funding. Um, But then, like I was saying before, what's exciting is that we are still aiming towards that long term vision, not needing to turn a profit next year individually, because they're targeting this, this long term vision, not, not revenue next month. Now, do you get to continue to work sort of on this specific project or do you, can you then just say, all right, well, I'm done with this and now I'm going to, I'm not going to make a time machine, for example, or I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to build that flying car that no one else has been able to do correctly yet. You know, my (laughs) personal expertise is such that I think I'm better off working on this project. I don't think you would want the flying car that I design. Um, But I mean, the NTT research is always, you know, looking for new ways. Uh, our tagline is to upgrade reality. Um, so what I'm working on relates to healthcare, but you know, I'll tell you, something. yeah. When, uh, when, when the company reached out to me about talking about some of the, the projects, they gave me a list of different projects that they were working on. And this was the, 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 the one that jumped out at me um, as the most exciting uh, just personally. Uh, but uh, you know, I, we may have some other guests on the show. So um, you guys were, were, were the number one choice. So I, I you know, you can have that in your quiver. Yeah. yeah. Uh, okay, Iris. Uh, thanks a lot for for joining us on the on the show. It was a great, great, uh, great technology and very exciting stuff. Yeah. Thanks so much for having me. All right. That's all the time we have for today's episode. Don't forget to like the video, subscribe to the channel, and add any comments you have below. Join us every week for new episodes of Today in Tech. Have a great day, and we'll see you next time.